words of power because we are kings and our words matter. I do not give you the right to sell it. He's not depriving me of ownership. He wants me to be the owner and never lose my ownership and my dominion over that land. That is why he's saying the land is mine. Besides, if the land is the Lord's and I am God's child, then whatever is my father's is mine. There are others who teach that there should be equal distribution of wealth, that everybody should have the same measure, you know, so many acres or whatever, equal distribution of wealth. All that sounds good and there's nothing wrong with it, but Jubilee is not teaching it. That's what I'm saying. Please understand. I'm not negating that and I'm not calling that wrong. I'm just saying that this Jubilee law has nothing to do with equal distribution of property. It has nothing to do with those who have sharing with the have-nots, there are other laws, like the ones we read in Leviticus 19, remember? Don't completely harvest your land, leave some for the poor, sojourner and all that. All those laws deal with the poor and how we must have concern and compassion for the poor and so on. There are other laws, God-given laws. But this Jubilee ordinance, we are talking about Jubilee. Jubilee was, doesn't have anything to do with that, not anything to do with equal distribution of wealth, nothing to do with the, the haves sharing, sharing with the have-nots and nothing to do with weakening of personal right to own, use, and enjoy wealth. It has nothing to do with that. 
It is wrong to think like that, that it has anything to do with Why? First of all, there is nothing equal about the Jubilee law. You know, Jubilee law is not the equal distribution or giving to the poor or anything like that. You look at it. Let me point out some, some things for you. In the Jubilee, when people benefit from the Jubilee year, one, the Levites don't get anything. God said, I am your inheritance. The Levites don't get anything, right? So this doesn't apply to the the Levite, you know, has nothing special to celebrate on Jubilee. He gets nothing. Secondly, the firstborn in every home receives double. So there's no equality there. Thirdly, daughters neither owned nor inherited anything, so they get no benefit out of Jubilee. They're not looking forward to do Jubilee. They get, got nothing in the first place. Non-Israelites who lived in Israel, among the Israelites, had no share in the land. They received no benefits. If they lost it, they lost it. They don't get it back. And Israelites, slaves, were released. And uh, women were released only if they were married to an Israel, Israel, Israelite in the land. From slavery, they were released. But otherwise, they are not released also. So you can see there is, this is not dealing with the poor or the condition of slavery or all these things, not, nothing. It is not dealing with all that. We talk about equality, there, is many, there are many inequalities here. You don't see equality here. So what is Jubilee all about? See, you have to understand what Jubilee is all about. Jubilee is about this, that God brought these people out of the land of Egypt when they were slaves and had nothing. They were deprived, robbed of everything, left high and dry, God brought them out and brought them into the promised land. God gave them the land. God gave them the land. And now, they have, by pledging and, and so on, they have given the land, you know, taken loan and given the land and so on, lost it. Now they are getting back. Only those people that were given the land are getting it back. What I'm saying is, God gave them the land, God never wanted to lose them. Since God gave them the land, God says, you shall get it back. I'm giving a law which will protect you for, from losing it ever. You cannot possibly lose it. Anytime you borrow, do any commercial activity with it, you shall not lose it. You will always get it back. I'm putting this law in place because I want to preserve your prosperity. I want to preserve the condition which I brought you into. In Genesis 1 and 2, God put man in the condition of abundance and plenty. God says, I brought you into the same condition when I brought you into the land of milk and honey. I want you to eat milk and honey forever. That's my will. I don't want you to ever lose it. So if you lost it, you get it back. That's the arrangement. It is to bring them to a land of prosperity and preserve that prosperity forever so that they never lose it. Now, but a lot of people read this verse 23 and say, see, brother, you're not right because it says the land shall not be sold permanently for the land is mine. Don't you agree that we don't own anything, that we should not own anything, that God owns everything? Now, let me give you an illustration. There are many parents who will not give a land or a house to a child if they felt that the child may sell it and go to nothing with it. If they, if they find that the child is irresponsible and will not be able to keep what is given, they will not give it. Have you ever met people like that? One man told me, I borrowed some money, put it in the bank safely because if it's in the house, this boy wants it all the time. He's telling me, sell and give it. I know if I sell and give it, he will go sell it. He will come to the street and drag me along with him to the street also. <laughs> I bought it with my money. <laughs> And all these years I worked and I bought it. I don't want to sell it. I don't want to lose it. I want to live here and die here. I don't want to ever lose it. He's not a responsible fellow. I don't want to give it to him. And also, it's not good for him. His children must, they must, they must enjoy it. I want his children to have it. And they must have some property. That's why I'm keeping it. I will not give And that guy is going around bad-mouthing the father. He says, man, this guy is an evil fellow. He's got worth two, three crores worth of property, will not give me even two, three lakhs. I'm all I'm asking is just five lakhs he's not giving me. You know, 
He's got so much money, he should just give it to me. You know, he should just sell it and give it to me. Well, after all, I'm a son. How can a father be like this? He thinks that the father is an evil father. But the fact is, the father is a good father. The father is saying, the land is not yours, it's mine. I have no objection to that. Because only if the land is the father's, it can be his. <laughs> it doesn't mean that the land is not his. He gets full enjoyment of it, free, full enjoyment of it. Plus, he gets the protection of abusing it and selling it and losing it and doing something foolish with it. So I say that I have no problem with God saying the land is mine. You don't sell it. Permanently, you cannot sell it. Use it, enjoy it, drink the milk and honey. Enjoy all the benefits that comes from it. But I do not give you the right to sell it. He's not depriving me of ownership. He wants me to be the owner and never lose my ownership and my dominion over that land. That is why he's saying the land is mine. Besides, if the land is the Lord's and I am God's child, then whatever is my father's is mine. So how can you say that God doesn't want us to have anything, that we are not owners of anything? I say to you, everything that belongs to God belongs to me. Amen. See, that is why in the New Testament, when God saved us, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, that God has blessed us with every blessing in Christ Jesus. Have you ever noticed that? Every blessing, but it's all in Christ Jesus. Every blessing is deposited in a safe place because God knows if he gave the deposit to us, we're going to blow it. So he gave it to a safe person, a person who will never blow it, never lose it, never leave us paupers. He gave it in Christ. He put everything in Christ. That's why the phrase in Christ is so important. He put every blessing of redemption and put it in Christ. Everything is earned. Redemption has happened and all the blessings and benefits are placed in Jesus Christ. You may say, well, how about me, brother? You are placed in Jesus Christ. Amen. So you can have access to everything and enjoy fully every blessing in and through Jesus Christ. You have any objection to it? If God gave it to another Adam, we'll have nothing today. God gave it to the right Adam, the last Adam. God guarantees there is no more Adam required needed because this last Adam is an unfailing Adam, an Adam that can never go wrong, an Adam that can never blow it, an Adam that can preserve it for us for all eternity. That is Jesus Christ our second Adam or the last Adam. Amen? Amen? Well, it's going in. So, this jubilee is to preserve the original integrity of the land as God has apportioned it in the beginning. The aim is to preserve the promise of enjoyment of abundance in the promised land. That's the aim. And Jubilee makes it harder for people to ruin the basic structures that God had created to secure their prosperity. God had made this a law so that they can never use, they never lose that land. This is not doing away with property rights. This is not saying you cannot, you have no right to own property, no. This is establishing property rights and saying this is that property rights are unalienable, unalterable, and absolute. In other words, God wants it to belong to you. It's yours. It should be yours forever. That is why it is God's forever. God is not against you owning anything. God is making sure that you own it forever. That is why he says, let the land be mine. You have no right to sell it forever. Amen? <laughs> So Jubilee is organized by God, or ordained by God to be like another exodus. It's like coming out of Egypt, slavery, into the promised land. This is a, another 
exodus-like. Those people that have borrowed, become slaves, could not pay their loans, got caught in a debt and so on, they can come out of that condition into the condition that God wants for them. So Jubilee must be viewed as another exodus. And you know, some of us need another exodus. <laughs> God has saved us, but we need another exodus of this type. And uh, the Jubilee is about that. In chapter 25, verse 18 and 19, we see the ultimate purpose of Jubilee. Listen to this. What is Jubilee all about? So you shall observe my statutes and keep my judgments and perform them, and you will dwell in the land in safety. Look at 19. Then the land will yield its fruit, and you will eat your fill and dwell there in safety. Those two lines are most important. You will eat your fill. I like that. God didn't say, I don't want you to eat your fill because then you'll be mischievous and you'll go wrong. <laughs> I want you to eat your fill, he says, and dwell in safety. I'm protecting you, he says. I'm saying the land is mine because I'm, I want to protect you. I want to keep it going for you. I want to make sure that everything is all right with you, that you never lose the blessings that has come to you. I want to protect you. I want to eat to the full. I want you to eat to the full and dwell in safety. That is why I got this law in place, he says. So God has done everything with a great vision. Even these economic laws, he has done with a great vision. Now, finally, let me just say this, because this, I think, is very important, because it really brings out how the spirit of this law has affected societies. In America, in the city of Philadelphia, there is what is called the Liberty Bell. Some of you may not know it. Tourists go and see it even today. And uh, it is a very great symbol of their independence and so on. And um, that Liberty Bell has an inscription on it around that bell. That inscription comes from chapter 25, verse 10. Proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. Leviticus 25, 10, it says. It gives us its reference also. Pro proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. Isn't it amazing that some people think liberty has, Leviticus has nothing to say to us? But those men at that time, hundreds of years ago, looked at Leviticus 25, Jubilee, and then the law and the economic law, that uh, uh, laws of economic life that God has given, and saw how it can affect societies, and they put it in that bell to proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants on that bell and say Levit Leviticus 25.10. Now, how did it affect that society? Every time when people fought for certain rights, they went to that bell where the bell was hanging. That is where they gathered. The abolitionists who wanted to abolish slavery used that place and that uh, bill uh, to talk about their liberty. They said, look at this. It says, proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. But we are slaves. Proclaim liberty. Set us free. Abolish slavery. Get rid of it. It's not right. Our society must not have, have it. And that is why they got slavery out. Because under that bill, they stood and they protested and they pointed to the verse that is written there to proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. And then another important thing, economically also it affected that society. Now, I'm trying to point out how good this Leviticus 25 is all about. Economically they were affected. One man when I was studying there, he asked me one time, he's telling me about America and I was just a young boy, didn't know much. So he said, do you know, Sam, what is the American dream? I thought, I took one good look, and all these guys have nice cars, you know. All these big, big cars, gas guzzlers, you know. I don't think it'll even go for one kilometer, you know, for a liter. Such big cars. And I said, you guys like cars, don't you? That's your American dream. He said, no. Here you can get any car you want, you know. 
That's not a dream anymore. That's not what you dream for. It's nothing. Anybody can get any car. I said, what's the dream then? He said, that American dream has to do with every citizen of this country, everyone that lives here, must own their own house. And he said to me, that dream comes from the law of Jubilee. That through the law of Jubilee, we can see that God brought the slaves from Egypt and made them land over owners overnight, just like that. When they trusted God, they, he brought them into the land of land flowing with milk and honey and made every one of these slaves, these poor slaves, landowners. They lived in houses, had, you know, vineyards, wells, and so on, lived in absolute prosperity. So the idea of living in prosperity and abundance and plenty comes from Deuteronomy 20, I mean, uh, Leviticus 25, they said. I was amazed with that, you know. It comes from there. That is where it comes from. The idea of prosperity, that God wants a good life. God wants us to live in our own houses, have our own lands. Now, that time I had just gone from India. You know, I, I was in a society where people claimed that they did not ha even have a land as big as the palm of their hands. And their goal was never to own anything. And on the day they die, they want to die without a penny in their pocket. That's the way you should live, they said. And I shouted hallelujah for it because I didn't know any better, you know. I thought this is what Christianity is all about. And here is this fellow telling me, the whole land, the society is based on this principle, to proclaim liberty through all the land, throughout all the land, to all its inhabitants. The ideal is that God wants you to have your own place, own house, own things, and live in abundance and plenty in a condition of affluence and plenty. That is God's will, that is God's vision, that is God's desire. And they said, our society is based on that vision that God has for us. I'm not talking about that society. I'm talking about how this word of God changes societies. I believe that it can change any society. Amen. If we look at this and stop believing that God doesn't want to have anything and start believing that God wants to make us who don't own any land, landowners, who don't own any house, house owners, hello, <laughs> and make us who have nothing sometimes into people who have something and bless us with his abundance and plenty. The moment we start believing it, then only we shall take, take a turn in our life. Many times as a man, the Bible truth is tremendous. As a man thinketh, so is he. Many times because of our thinking, we are going in the direction, in a particular direction in our life. Our direction will change, our life will change when we start thinking differently and when we start thinking according to God's word. I challenge you to think according to God's word. I challenge you to think in terms of jubilee, that God's desire is your jubilee. Enter into your jubilee. Your jubilee has been in existence for the last 2,000 years. Don't ask me when is the 50th year coming now. It came 2,000 years ago. And we are still in that 50th year. We are in the jubilee. It is a perpetual jubilee year after year. From now, from the last 2,000 years ago, it started. And throughout all eternity, it is jubilee for all those who believe in Jesus Christ and put their faith in him. They can claim their jubilee. Yes. Go back to your possessions. Take back everything that is lost, your dignity, your happiness, your joy, your peace. Put back the broken life. Put back the pieces together because it is jubilee time. Take back everything that you lost. Command everything to come together in the name of Jesus. Drive out every chaos and darkness and emptiness and rebuild your life according to the design that God established as the paradigm for your life. God bless you. Let's clap our hands. When you sing this, sing it like a prayer, all right? Really meaning it. I'm here.
you make me everybody as I long as I long draw me to your arms as I stand and sing your praise you come you come and you fill this place won't you come won't you come and fill this place as I wait Fill this place and to make your presence known in our presence.